Thank you uh, very much for inviting me to this uh, talk. It's always a pleasure to uh, come back to the Scuola Normale uh, and to give a talk in this room the first time. When I was a student, this was uh, used for very different purposes. It was part of the uh, library at that time. Um, I want, this is the title of my talk, and uh, uh, well, what I want to do is explain there. Uh, I, the question is, uh, we know very well that uh, when <coughs> Uh, the kinetic term of field theories contains higher time derivatives. We typically end up with ghosts uh, and physical propagating modes. Uh, nevertheless, we may legitimately ask the question if higher derivative theories can be uh, unitary, and by in particular higher uh, derivative theories of gravity, or at least if they are not unitary, could they be non-unitary in an interesting way to be defined later? Okay, let's start from basic things. We all know, know how to take a scalar product in field theory. Uh, take the simplest case, just a, scale, a massive, single massive scalar. Well, you know that if the uh, equations of motion are uh, these, right, if, uh, then uh, you just take out one derivative basically and you end up with uh, a scalar product, which is simply the positive frequency part of the on shell field phi, right, time derivative and integrated over a space-like surface. That we all know, right? Now, the, uh, of course, this generalizes equally easily to the case of n scalars. And now I can take an arbitrary kinetic term, Aij, and the mass matrix, Bij. In that case, the, I have to solve the equations of motion for phi, find the on-shell fields, separate in positive and negative frequency, which is a thing that I assume I can do with this choice of parameters. And, uh, uh, and then this is the kinetic term. So kinetic term is exactly like before, except that I sprinkle some indices and they have this matrix A. Now, one interesting case is, arises for this choice of kinetic term, completely off-diagonal, anti-diagonal, I would say, and uh, a mass matrix that has an anti-diagonal term and then a bunch of ones above. Uh, the equations of motion a, a nice structure because uh, the, when you apply the Klein-Gordon operator to the ith field, you get the ith minus one. Right? And you get a sort of descent equation that ends with the field phi one that obeys the standard <coughs> Klein-Gordon equation. Uh, this means also that the highest field phi n obeys a Klein-Gordon to the power n. So you see that here we have a high derivative theory. We, ha we have, uh, in a sense, worked backward. We started with n fields obeying second order equations, and we ended up with a single field obeying an nth order equation. All the masses are degenerate, and that's what makes this model interesting. Right? If the masses were non-degenerate, then uh, we would find ghosts and uh, physical particles in a pretty straightforward manner. Here we have a, an, an arb arbitrarily high degeneration, n particles all with the same mass. Okay, so what happens in this case? Well, what happens is that we can ask a question. When do we have unitarity in this case? Well, there are three possible answers. Uh, never, always, and sometimes. Never, why never? Well, because Aij has negative eigenvalues, and you just diagonalize, find negative and positive. Right, that, so that would seem to suggest that this theory has always uh, negative eigenvalues. On the other hand, this is a free theory, and you may say, no, look, uh, a, this matrix A has a positive subspace, which is given uh, explicitly here. Right. You can see the dot. So this particular combination of the fields, phi i and phi n plus i minus 1, uh, is, uh, has eigenvalue plus 1. Well, on the other hand, that's not... Uh, uh, completely true, and the answer is sometimes, because the point is that it's true that I have a positive subspace, but under time evolution, actually, this subspace is not closed. So and this happens because the i-th field evolves in i, in phi i, plus all the fields with index uh, uh, less than i. So actually, this uh, uh, eigenspace is not left invariant by time evolution. So uh, mm, uh, this, uh, I say it sometimes because actually there is one case instead in which time evolution preserves uh, the uh, positive subspace. And this is when, uh, when you are in the middle of the way, when this index i is the same as n plus 1 minus i. Right? Why? Well, in that case, in that case, 
uh, you can actually find a subspace which is not just one uh, linear combination of scalars, but it's a little bit larger, and uh, it's given in this way. Okay, when these two indices are equal, so when n is odd, of course, all right, then you can set uh, some of the fields uh, phi i equal to zero. In particular, you say that all the fields phi i with i strictly less than this middle value n plus one minus two, n plus one over two, sorry, think of n equals two, three as a simple example, right? Then this, in the middle value, you, uh, you set everything that is less than uh, the middle value equal to zero. Then what do you get? Well, you get a reduced matrix right, that has uh, uh, actually a lot of zero eigenvalues and one positive eigenvalue. So uh, this matrix is uh, non-negative. And in particular, if you mod out by uh, uh, the modes phi j with j this time strictly above the middle value, you get a positive definite space. Right. So you take a, a big, you set to zero some of the fields. Time evolution keeps those fields uh, zero, right? If they were zero at time zero, they are uh, zero at all uh, uh, subsequent time and also before, of course. Uh, you mod out by certain other fields and you get a positive definite space. And uh, we have seen this structure before, of course, because that looks a lot like the gauge theory structure when you quantize covariantly. Now, I gave my example in flat space, but there is actually the most interesting example uh, appears in anti de Sitter space. In anti de Sitter space, uh, if I write the metric a la in a Poincare patch, uh, so in this way, right, uh, then uh, I, I know that my scalars obey very simple equations, in particular, the scalar phi one, the one that obey the standard clyde gordon equation, will have a power-like behavior. It will have, uh, in particular, it will have generically a, a near horizon behavior, horizon being at z equal to zero, of course, as z to a certain delta minus, where delta minus is the lowest value given by this equation, right? this is standard idea CFT. Uh, so here we have a power-like behavior for phi one, but of course the other fields obey, do not have a power-like behavior. Uh, and that's what makes them interesting. In general, the field phi i has a power-like behavior right, and times logarithms. This is a special solution, the, the normalizable mode right, here. Um, so a, a normalizable mode in, uh, uh, for my system of fields will also contain logarithms. Right. And uh, now, the fact that these scalar fields uh, behave near the boundary with logarithms also tells me that if there is a, a um, conformal field theory dual for this system of scalars, uh, then this will have some interesting properties, right? Now, we know how to do the, the to, to find the dual, so the ADS-CFT duality simply states that uh, uh, the appropriately regularized action for my fields in ADS uh, expressed in terms of the boundary values, where the boundary values are given here. So I have phi i times this known dependence on z, right? Well, s as a function of the boundary value is the generating function for uh, the correlators of operators whose source is phi. Yeah. And so in particular, if I want the endpoint correlator, I have to take the uh, nth variation of my functional w, also known as s, and get an explicit expression. Now, we have a free action, and that's enough to compute at least the two-point function of such operators. If we want more, we need a more complicated, more interesting theory. But if we limit ourselves to the two-point function, then we can compute what is the correlator of the two operators dual to the source. And we can do that by choosing an appropriate way of expressing the fields phi in anti de Sitter parameterized by my radial coordinate z and all the other coordinates x as a function of the boundary value times certain Green's functions. And these Green's functions that are in green, to show that they're Green's functions, uh, obey ex exactly the same equations as the fields, uh, because the, uh, this equation, of course, has some deltas on the boundary, but uh, if I'm interested that g in the bulk, then this is just a, a homogeneous equation. Um, by definition, g0 vanishes. So I have uh, this expression. I can actually co find all this g uh, uh, quite easily once I know the um, <coughs> Green's function for uh, the 
Klein-Gordon equation, because then I can actually get all the order. So I can get the uh, uh, G1, simply because it's the standard function for Klein-Gordon. All the order I get by taking derivatives with respect to m squared. Right? If I take derivatives of left and right hand side uh, of my equations, I can get all the higher ones. And it's a standard, it's a rather straightforward calculation. Now, when you take this expression uh, and you substitute into the action, you'll get uh, actually plenty of divergent terms, divergent terms that you can regularize straightforwardly. And then uh, once you do the regularization, you compute the two-point function and you get the correlator of the operators dual to the source. And, and here is the uh, surprise, well, so maybe not such a surprise, but we get exactly something that we, we like, namely the correlator of uh, two such functions is a constant times the standard power-like behavior for fields of conformal dimension delta times also logarithmic factor. And uh, uh, the, um, so this is what, uh, uh, this is a structure that uh, is different from a standard conformal field theory because of this logarithm, right? And uh, uh, moreover, we find for the operators O the exact equivalent of the um, uh, statement uh, that we read in in terms of scalar fields, namely when you take uh, operator OI with index that is uh, uh, less than, that obeys this equation, so with, when you take uh, OI and OJ uh, small enough, right, then you will get that the uh, correlator of the two-point functions vanish. So there are uh, certain correlation functions of the operators O that vanish when the O's are, uh, have low uh, index, O1, O2, etc. So, uh, the moral of the story, uh, these uh, 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 correlators uh, have this form. There are plenty of null correlators. One correlator, when i plus j minus n minus 1 is equal to 0, right, uh, in, uh, for which this uh, two-point function is actually uh, non-logarithmic, log to the 0 means 1 in this case, and then the other have logarithms, right? And uh, so, when we, actually, this means that when we mod out by the null operators, by null operator means the ones that have uh, zero correlators among themselves, you get actually the structure of a, a standard conformal field theory, in which you have one operator that is non-logarithmic and uh, you, the other have been modded out. So, uh, to do that, actually, if you want O with an index to have a non-zero, a non-logarithmic uh, OP with itself, you need N odd. And then for N odd, we get exactly the counterpart of the statement that we had for scalars. For N odd, this uh, conformal field theories, which have uh, logarithmic correlators, and therefore we can call logarithmic conformal field theories, right, uh, have actually the same structure of gauge theories. So we have a subspace of a larger space with indefinite metric that contains only physical and null states. And null states can be removed by defining physical states as, equivalent, uh, as equivalence classes. So this is exactly what we will get for a, a, a covariant quantization of a, uh, of a gauge theory, even if here we only have scalars. Right? But the structure is the same. Now, of course, this factorization into um, non-physical, physical, and null, right? In this, into this triplet is not possible when n is even. But in any case, uh, when either, um, uh, for either n even or odd, actually what we found, uh, the operators that we found here are, uh, well, can be called the operators of a conformal field theory in the sense that this theory carries a logarithmic representation of the conformal uh, group. Uh, and by this, uh, um, I, I mean, one of the many ways of defining that is to say that if you take the conformal group and you decompose into the maximal compact subgroup, right, uh, then uh, you can identify this compact subgroup SO2 as the generator of time translation. Right? And uh, uh, in, in, in a logarithmic conformal field theory, when the generator of this SO2 acts on one of my fields, aka states, I'll get this field with a certain fixed conformal dimension, but plus a tail, right? And that's what tells me that the representation is not the standard one, right? So this representation in the interesting case is uh, uh, irreducible, but not in the composable, if the terms right. 
So uh, this uh, simple system of scalars actually defines dually a um, logarithmic representation or multi-logarithmic representation of the conformal group and possibly also a logarithmic conformal field theory. Now, logarithmic conformal field theory and logarithmic representations of the conformal group uh, are not uh, unitary. Well, we, in a sense, we saw it already, but uh, it's also clear that they are not unitary because all unitary representations of the conformal group have been classified and the logarithmic are not there. Right? And, uh, but they could be interesting in statistical mechanics or condensed matter, and I'm sure that in this audience there are people who know much more than me. Now, in statistical mechanics, definitely, they have been used. I don't know examples in condensed matter, so we, but uh, once you have this, oftentimes you can find a little bit of work also the other application. Now, in what I did so far, the, um, I just looked at scalars, but conformal field theories have an energy momentum tensor, right? And uh, in, in, the, if you, in the case that you have an anti-de-sitter dual, this means that the metric in anti-de-sitter is dynamical right? because it has, uh, it is the field, is the source of the field T, but that means in the, that is dynamical. So we can legitimately ask the, the question uh, uh, of what happens if the equations of motion governing the metric are themselves higher derivatives. So we could have just higher derivative scalars coupled to normal gravity, but it's more interesting to ask what happens if even gravity is higher derivative. Right? Uh, could one find a higher derivative unitary theory of gravity? Well, we found one for free scalars. Finding one for gravity, which can never be free, is another matter altogether, but we can at least try. And to see what happens and uh, what are the problems, we can look actually at an interesting failure. Uh, we look at a theory that uh, could have been maybe unitary, but was not, ultimately. And uh, that's what is called critical gravity. Critical gravity is a higher derivative theory of gravity uh, that is not Weyl square. It's a different theory. It is obtained by taking uh, um, the Einstein term with a cosmological constant and adding appropriate terms that are quadratic in the Einstein tensor and in the Ricci scalar. Uh, with appropriate coefficients a and b, what happens is that uh, there are no scalar degrees of freedom propagating and only massless spin two and spin one modes propagate. Okay. So uh, this is an interesting theory in which you have no massive modes propagating in anti de uh, Generically, for A and B generic, you do have massless modes, but if you, are, uh, if you two find one such solution that was studied by uh, uh, Lou Pope and others and, and may have omitted a lot of other people that work in this field. Now, when uh, th these co coefficients are tuned such as to have no massive degrees of freedom, then you can also rewrite this action here, which is quadratic in the curvatures, into an action that is linear in the curvature with the help of an auxiliary field F. F is auxiliary, non-dynamic. You can solve its equations of motion. They're algebraic and free, are quadratic, right? And then if you solve the equations of motion for F, you get back this action with the appropriate coefficients A and B, right? Uh, now, if you take this form of the action, it's useful because it becomes very similar to what we already studied. In particular, if we take this action and we linearize around an anti background, which is a solution of this equation for appropriately chosen coefficients, then we'll get a quadratic action for uh, the fluctuation of the metric H which is here, and for the linearization of F, I will give it later when it's useful, uh, I'll get an action that looks a lot like the one I had before. So the action for H in an appropriate gauge and neglecting terms that uh, are, I mean, and restricting to the transverse traceless modes, etc., is just this. So you see that if I call, if, A, if I just drop the indices mu and nu, right, I would get an action, uh, one of my critical system, the critical system with n equals to two, two scalars. Well, in this case, there are two tensors, h and k. But the structure is the same, an anti-diagonal kinetic term and a mass matrix that has a diagonal term and an off-diagonal term. Right? So this will give me equations of motion that are just uh, uh, the appropriate generalization of Klein-Gordon square, which I give here, right? Linearize the equation of motion around the ADS background, tell me that uh, this operator, right, 
applied on the metric, well, for an Einstein model, it will give me zero, but here instead it gives me the second mode, k, and so this is what I called phi one before, right? And then the same operator applied to k is equal to zero, which means that k obeys the standard uh, equations of motion of under the sitter Einstein's gravity. And here you can prove that h are transverse and trace. Right? Now, so as I said before, this Lagrangian equation of motion are the same, have the same structure as my system, which I studied for n equals to two, and that immediately tells me that the scalar product is exactly as before, is given here. So you see that uh, uh, this already tells me that uh, this scalar product, since we have n equals to two, an even number of uh, uh, fields, it cannot have a positive invariant subspace because k solves Einstein's equation, the scalar product of Einstein modes does not vanish in dimension larger than three. So in other words, what I mean by, by this, I mean the following. Uh, take <coughs> a case in which, say, uh, we have two modes, uh, unprimed and primed. Take, say, the primed mode to obey Einstein's equations. What does it mean, Einstein's equation? It means that k prime uh, is equal to zero and h prime satisfies the Einstein's equations. Right? Then when you substitute in here, actually, since k prime vanishes, my kinetic term has this phase. Say, h prime and k. k always obeys the Einstein's equations. h prime obeys the Einstein's equations because we told it to do so. But now, what I have here is actually the scalar product of two Einstein's modes. Can it vanish generically for a ge generic two Einstein's modes? No, right? because that's the scalar, the scalar product in Einstein's gravity, which is uh, positive right, for physical modes. So this means that actually uh, you cannot factor out one of the two modes. I mean, you cannot simply uh, say, okay, I choose k equal to zero for all modes, and then I get back Einstein's gravity. I will get zero, right? I mean, we, the off-diagonal uh, term of the scalar product does not vanish. Exactly as it did not vanish for uh, scalars. Here I had to do a little bit more work because these case were not really scalars, were uh, uh, transfer trace resistance. Okay. So we abandoned the model. Well, not yet because there is actually one case that I should be careful about. The case is when k, you remember k always obeys Einstein's equations, right? When k actually is uh, the symmetric uh, gradient of a vector, right? In this case, in Einstein's theory, such a mode would be a, um, a pure gauge. But not in this case, because you remember, this object is not the fluctuation of the metric. It's uh, the linearization of the tensor F, uh, right? So this A is not a diffeomorphism, right? This is a physical degree of freedom. Indeed, if you recall, when I talked about this theory, I said it also propagates spin ones, massless spin ones. This, uh, they are here. Well, spin ones, let's not call them massless. Let's say what, what they are, right? Uh, now, what is this mode? Well, um, you see, you can compute actually, uh, you can say, well, let's not take a generic uh, solution of my higher derivative system, but take, let's take a solution in which actually this mode k is non-vanishing, but it looks like a pure gauge, if you want to abuse the notation. Then, well, I can compute uh, actually the scalar product of these two modes. Actually, if you want really to compute the scalar uh, product and, for instance, check that actually this scalar product is invariant when you do a true bona fide gauge transformation, uh, general diffeomorphism, you'll have to um, play a little with it. You'll have to rewrite your uh, scalar product in a more covariant way than before, right? By introducing, by integrating over, uh, actually converting your three-dimensional integral into a four-dimensional integral, right, thanks to, uh, uh, we introducing also some auxiliary vectors like the x xi, which is not killing. This is not a killing vector. This is a vector orthogonal to a space-like surface. But it is uh, uh, divergenceless and uh, irrotational. And well, you have to play a little bit with these uh, uh, formulas and notice this fact. When k is, quote unquote, pure gauge, the fact that it's transverse and traceless tells me that the vector A actually obeys a very specific equation of motion. It is this one. This tells me that A actually is a proca mode. Right? So I said massless scalar is incorrect. It's a proca mode right? with, uh, with a very specific mass, which is positive, by the way. I try to obscure this here, but it's positive. Uh, and uh, um, so you can uh, compute, for instance, the, um, uh, the scalar product of two modes, and you can verify uh, that actually the scalar product of one such mode with a pure Einstein mode vanishes, but when both of these psi are non-Einstein, 
in the sense that the, that the field k is non-zero, but k is pure gauge, right? then the scalar product no, it does not vanish. And not only does not vanish, but after a few manipulations, it turns out to be exactly the canonical norm for a spin one field. So you may say, great, this is a, 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 this is a very, uh, this is a great result. It means that actually in my big space of solutions, right, I have isolated a positive definite subspace. This positive definite subspace did not exist for scalars because scalars couldn't have this uh, structure, right? So I can get a spin one, a positive definite subspace. So, so uh, what happens to the spin two? Well, the spin two, uh, I, in order to get, a, uh, well, I'll get Einstein modes plus this object, right? Now, on the other hand, there is a problem. And, and the problem arises in nonlinear order, right? So in particular, I could mod, mod out by Einstein terms, right? And I will get uh, uh, easily uh, just a positive definite scalar. Now, the problem is, why do, don't I keep the Einstein's mode? Because Einstein mode with Einstein mode gives a zero, so it cannot be a physical mode. It has to be a gauge mode, right? So the only physical mode is this spin, spin one. And now you may object uh, what happens to the metric. It's dynamical, right? How can I just uh, throw it out? And indeed, I cannot. In the sense that actually the construction I uh, did here works also at nonlinear order. Uh, you can, uh, to make it work at nonlinear order, you just g give a specific ansatz for this auxiliary field F that only contains a vector, substitute into the action, and get this one. This action looks very nice, but it's not. You see, this is an action of a proper scalar with positive mass. On the other hand, the metric here is dynamical. You don't have an Einstein term. Right? which means that here, right, when you compute, you still have to compute the equation of motion for G, is dynamical, but the equation of motion for G tell me that T mu nu, the stress energy tensor of a positive mass vector vanishes. And unfortunately, the only solution is uh, A equal to zero in this case. So actually, nonlinear effects uh, kill the mode. Right? The theory exists at linear order, but at nonlinear order, uh, the vector, yes. And yes. Oh, in this theory, lambda is always negative. Sorry, say DS. I am taking a DS, yes. Now, we can try to use the other system uh, the, 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 that we had to get a unitary subspace, take N odd. Well, there is a generalization to N equals to 3, for instance, of higher derivative gravity that is given here. It involves uh, uh, the vial tensor and actually the box applied to vial tensor with very specific coefficients, and it was worked out in this uh, paper. And uh, now, our contribution to this was uh, uh, simply to try to redo the analysis and find the scalar product and see what are the eventual problems. Now, um, um, we, the point is that it, everything works at, non -lin at linear order, in, even in this n equals to 3 theory, but what about the nonlinear uh, extending the theory to nonlinear order? And uh, the problem is the, the following. Uh, you remember, how do we get a unitary theory? We set to zero a, um, a mode, right? Uh, you set to zero k, right? And then uh, you uh, mod out by the metric, uh, right? Which uh, um, is, the, uh, is a gauge mode. That works at uh, a linear order. And on linear order, well, you have, uh, well, you have uh, one problem. The problem is that you cannot simply say uh, set k equal to zero. You have to find a conserved charge that sets uh, k equal to zero. Right? And this charge actually has to have two properties. Well, it has to be positive definite. So setting it to zero means uh, that k vanishes. Right? There should be a positivity uh, uh, condition. And it also should allow for non-trivial solutions, right? for non-trivial physical modes. Now, the problem is that the only charge that we have, the only conserved charge that fits the bill, is the energy, essentially. But the energy is neither positive nor has the second property. And the, the, you see, the energy, of course, mirrors the scalar product. It's essentially a scalar product with, with one extra time derivative, this k dot. And as you see, since the kinetic term is of diagonal, since the scalar product is of diagonal, also the energy is not positive definite. Uh, now, so it is not positive, but there is a worse problem here. The problem is that if, suppose that by some miracle, I am actually able to set the offending mode k equal to zero and do the uh, restriction that I did at linear order, right? Then in that case, uh, 
this term vanishes, uh, this term vanishes, I end up with this uh, last term, which is the standard expression for the energy of uh, our physical mode, but it's positive, right? Which means that E cannot be zero, right? Because that was the condition that defined the subspace. And so uh, if E is equal to zero, then also phi equal to zero. If uh, E is non-zero and K vanishes, then K does not really vanish, because actually, you see, the energy in any gravitational theory can only be expressed through a Gauss law as a boundary integral. And the boundary integral depends on the metric, on, on the solution of your field equation, but expanded to higher order, at least second order. And in particular, if E is equal to zero, right, it, you can check that this means that equal to zero means that this integral does not vanish, but this integral, which reminds you of the ADM expression for energy in gravity, depends precisely on the mode k. So e non-zero means k non-zero at some order, in particular already at quadratic order, right? which means that, the, uh, that they have a linearization instability. I can set k to zero at linear order, but if I have any physical mode, then the uh, Einstein's equations punish me and tell me that this k is not zero at all orders, but it, uh, uh, it, it appears at second order. I get a logarithmic mode, which means that I have that my reduction doesn't work. So unfortunately, it seems that these theories, at least the, the ones that we studied, the parity invariant are uh, bad. Uh, and when we're faced with a difficult problem, we do what all theoretical physicists do, we study another one. Right? So, uh, um, and, uh, so I, I, I want to leave these higher derivative gravities for the moment um, and uh, go back to scalars. But look at the case n equals to 2. There was one case that we overlooked. In, when we study the system of two scalars. And this, when the mass assumes this value, minus 5 over 4L, where L is the ADS radius, in that case, the conformal dimensions associated to this field are 5 half and 1 half. This is what's called the singleton representation. And why it's called the singleton is exactly the aim of this uh, few next transparencies. The action has the same form that I gave before, first line. But I, you see that here I add a boundary term. So besides the bulk action, I decided to uh, add a boundary term that essentially allows me to keep some extra modes in the expansion of my scalar field. Notice that the boundary term is uh, written in terms of these derivatives along the boundary. The boundary is time-like. There are time derivatives. So this boundary contribution to the action contains time derivatives. It changes the scalar product. Right? It changes the definition of scalar product. And this has a profound consequence because it uh, does the, the following. Well, first of all, let's study what are the uh, uh, generic solutions to my equations of motion. Right? Well, generic, I mean the solutions with uh, the normalized, generic normalized solutions of the equations of motion. Two scalars. Uh, the scalar phi uh, has a power-like behavior, power-like plus uh, times the logarithm. Psi, which is the, what I call the scalar phi 1 in my general classification, if you remember the beginning of my talk, goes like a power. So uh, what uh, well, I would say, fine, uh, this is the gauge mode, and this is the unphysical mode. Right? So there is nothing left. Well, except that my boundary conditions actually were tailored in an appropriate way. They are the ones given by uh, uh, Flato and Fronsdal, written in a different way, but they are the same, actually. And, uh, uh, the boundary conditions allow uh, also this behavior. Normally, so with z to the one half, normally this would be a non-normalizable mode. But my choice of boundary conditions actually make it normalizable, provided that this field phi of x function only of the boundary coordinates. Here I am in ADS4, so this is a three-dimensional field. Actually, uh, it's not generic, as it would be in the general case, but obeys actually a free... Um, a free scalar equation, you see. So this, is, this phi is not a generic field, it's a free three-dimensional scalar. This is the only solution that still preserves normalizability, right? And then, well, even when I uh, kill the unphysical modes, say that my physical subspace does not allow for these fields, and mod out by gauge fields, I'm still left with one, and precisely one, three-dimensional massless field, which is the famous singleton. So what we, I have constructed is a very redundant description for a three-dimensional massless scalar. It's a bulk action that describes one single degree of freedom, the, the, uh, which in the bulk is the singleton. Right? Uh, now, if you compute the scalar product, you'll notice that appropriately on the physical subspace where psi, all the size vanish, there is no contribution right, in the physical subspace. But since I changed the 
um, scalar product by changing boundary conditions, right? I do have a contribution that is only non-zero for the singleton. So the singleton is actually a positive norm. Right? So everything works according to the general principles, appropriately modified in this case, minimally modified. And then I have this very redundant construction, a very large bulk action that describes one singleton, which is one three-dimensional degree of freedom. Uh, why I do that? Well, I mean, by the way, you can also do a BRS uh, construction that gives exactly the same thing. And in that case, physical subspace means BRS closed and, uh, uh, and of course, non-gauge means closed but not exact, right? usual stuff. Now, the advantage of having a bulk description for my singleton is that uh, I can repeat the story uh, uh, that I uh, had for the scalar and also define current, right? So um, I can define a bulk current, right? So in, you remember that in the duality in between uh, higher spin models, the Vassiliev models, and uh, uh, conformal field theories, uh, one particular, uh, one case that is well understood is when the duality is with a free ON model, so with, free N, with N free scalars. In that case, uh, the operators that are dual to the massless high spin fields in the bulk are actually bilinears in the free scalars on the boundary. Here I have one scalar, but I can, of course, repeat the construction for n such fields. Now, my redundant construction allows me to extend those currents in the bulk, because the, actually I can write a, um, a current which has a boundary term in the bulk, not surprisingly, the boundary term is closed but not exact, and the bulk term instead is exact. So again, I have extended my, fee, my uh, operators, but again, they are the same as, um, uh, as in the boundary case. Well, uh, on the other hand, uh, again, this redundancy may be useful. This is a sort of, of, of daydream, but I still think that it could be useful because <coughs> This, uh, uh, with bulk currents, you can construct a bulk action out of the bilinear fields. This would be different from the Vasiliev action. This would be uh, more similar to what you have in QCD, where you have in four dimensions a bulk theory, we don't know it, but we, we suppose that there is, right, made of meson fields in the large end limit. That would be a good description of, uh, say, uh, uh, QCD. You have just uh, large end, you, we expect a theory of weakly interacting mesons, right? So this is in four dimensions, it's a theory of composite fields. There is an infinite number of fields. I can re-express the same theory also in four dimensions in terms of quarks and gluons, of course. And this, well, the dream is that maybe we can do the same. We can think of this phi and psi as the quarks that uh, uh, describe the Vasiliev theory. The quarks whose mesons are the uh, Vasiliev fields. Uh, who knows if that is true, but I, I, well, we know that we can dream of some structure in the bulk that could do that. We could try to mimic, for instance, the construction that we have in, in uh, string field theory, where uh, we have a BRS operator and we define a kinetic term in terms of just the, all the operators that are bil bilinear in phi and psi and define a kinetic term in such a way, right, a, a la string field theory. Uh, and then define interactions by taking uh, products. I don't know how to define the products of the scalar fields. So in principle, there could be something similar. And uh, actually, uh, I think that I'm out of time. And maybe it's good to, to end on a sort of speculative note like this, because after all, this is the, uh, I mean, this is part of a project. Uh, the, the ERC grant may be uh, winding down, but of course, we want to think about the future. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for your patience. <laughs> Well, the role of uh, ADS in, in this game is just uh, to give you a boundary where to play with this boundary term, or is there, you can see a more important role in your consideration. You mean the role of ADS in this construction? Yes, in just, the the, just the fact that you have a boundary? Or? Well, it is important for this construction. It only works, in, uh, as I did here, if you have a time-like boundary because you remember that in order to get actually a positive kinetic term and get actually some propagating modes, I had to change the boundary conditions, but change them with time derivatives, because otherwise I don't change the kinetic term and they will get that even this mode, this singleton will have zero uh, norm. So uh, at least at this point, I don't know how to uh, deal with other types of boundaries. I don't know.
very glad to hear that you refer to Froflat and Fransdal, but in this case, actually, you can refer even to an earlier work by Dirac. So Dirac exactly considered the boundary conditions that you have considered, and just did, well, figured out that these are conformal fields in slightly different terms. So he was probably the one who was making the first crucial step towards ADS safety in, I, I guess, in 63. This is the work by the uh, work. Indeed. I mean, the, the difference is that Dirac uh, studied just uh, a standard uh, action, right? And sta uh, while uh, Flatten Fransdal studied this dipole uh, in action. This, in this sense, uh, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, in any case, he was punished for that because, after all, uh, as you know, uh, Flatten and Fransdal called uh, the supersymmetric extension of these the singletons yeah. these and racks. When you combine them, you get a massless spinner, a Dirac spinner. Okay.